Silicon Valley computer scientist. He's founder of Clear Light Ventures, an organization which researches efforts to reduce environmental factors that impair public health. He's going to discuss his personal family experience with autism spectrum disorder and how he improved the health of his family with EMF reduction. Because of his experience, he's been interested and involved in research related to electromagnetic fields and knows a great deal about the science of EMF. We're very pleased to have Peter speak to us today. Thank you. How's it? The audio is good? So I'm calling this Reducing uh, Digital Overload in a Wireless Era. And I'm not really going to talk about the science. The, science have done that, or the scientists have done that already. I'm going to talk about more about our personal experience. So this is our family's story. Um, this started kind of in a shocking way. This is a, these are photos from about 2003. Uh, in about 1999, when my son Jack was kicked out of preschool, he came home and found out that not only was he kicked out of preschool, but the teacher asked that he suggested that we get a, a psychological diagnosis for him. So we went to the Children's Health Council here, and um, uh, they diagnosed him with sensory integration, which is kind of the, uh, the low end of the autism spectrum, a symptom that most autistics have. Um, and so that was pretty devastating. Um, but I, I kind of at that time just said, well, I'm kind of sensitive. My son's sensitive, so we'll just cope. And we did all kinds of sensory. Uh, we, we worked on all kinds of therapies to reduce sensory load and noise and harsh clothing, et cetera, just to make the environment a little softer and de-stress it. But then uh, in 2003, when my second son went to preschool, um, the teachers also asked to have a conference, and we had five teachers set up to talk to us like an intervention. And they said, you know, your son Max has um, not been interacting with other students. He's just kind of sitting in the corner and staring off into the corner. Um, and that was just, uh, and, uh, we had kind of seen that. It was really hard for us. I've been really focusing on Jack, and it was really hard for me to see that, that Max, who had actually been really developing normally, this was kind of a case of progressive autism, where he had had good eye contact. He was really, he was the easy baby. He just dropped off the cliff and just started, you started seeing the thousand mile, thousand foot stair or whatever, you're just kind of like this. And um, so at that point I started really, that really shook my belief that this was entirely a genetic situation. Uh, and at that time I was also starting to have some serious issues as well. So I was had, had food allergies and I was having fatigue and becoming chemically sensitive and uh, not sleeping well, losing weight, there's a lot going on. And so I started looking at, you know, we started looking at everything. So we looked at genetics, we started playing, everybody, everybody kind of goes through these things when you go through chronic. You think about the genetics, you go through, you look at diet next, uh, you get into toxins, and you start looking at toxins in the home and mold, start reducing mold and all, everything you can think of basically. Now, I never, as a Silicon Valley engineer, I never would have looked at EMF. Straight up honest, the only reason I would have, I actually kind of thought it was you were non scientific if you brought it up. Um, then, in this weakened state, I started to feel in about 2007, I could feel a cell phone next to my head. And I was an early adopter, I had a smartphone back in about 2003, 2004. So that, that was really kind of hard to deny. Uh, and then one day in about 2007, I was climbing under my desk and plugged in a transformer. And my head just felt fuzzy for about 40 minutes after that experience. Uh, so I started you know, getting some EMF experts to come in, start measuring our house, and we started reducing magnetic fields and working with building biologists. Uh, and so it's been eight years we've been working on that. And so we've really gone through systematically with the kids and done everything we could, and slowly things got better. You know, We just wanted our kids to live up to their full potential. And I can say today that um, they have. So my son Jack, our experience with autism is kind of gone now. We don't even really talk about it. My son Jack's a sophomore at Cal. He just had an internship with Tesla Motors. Um, my son Max, who really did not have a friend until he was six years old, uh, is now uh, got the lead in a school play, and it's just un unbelievable. So you know, one step at a time. And I'm sleeping well. My weight is back. I was down 131 pounds, so I'm 100. About 55 right now, so can you imagine me 20 pounds lighter? It was, yeah, thank you. Uh, I was actually going to include a picture, but it was a little too freaky. I've, I've got some, you know. So, so I'm going to talk about the autism puzzle from my perspective as a parent and just listen to the scientists and try to summarize what these other doctors have talked about. Um, genetics, we all start with the genetic component. 
But again, as Dr. Saruji said, it's not the entire picture. Uh, and then some of the genetics are de novo mutations, which are, called, which are basically non-inherited mutations. So that leads you back to looking at the environment or other factors that could cause these mutations. So again, the next thing we started looking at is your biological capacity, or the, the doctors call this physiology. So how much glutathione do you have? How much melatonin? You know, what are all your different levels ser and serotonin? Um, and also, what mode is your body in? Is your body in fight or flight mode? Or is it in rest or digest and you know, grow mode? And those are significantly different because as you, um, if you're in fight or flight mode, it's not sustainable. And you, your body's gonna try to defer anything that it can, anything that's not necessary for immediate survival. But you know, this mechanism wasn't designed to be a long-term sustainable thing. It works great if a tiger's chasing you, but not if you're in a Wi-Fi building that you're not gonna escape. So next, mentally, we start talking about chemical toxins, and I, I started looking at mercury. I had some mercury fillings, and that was an issue for me. But you know, there's 85,000 toxins in commerce, and uh, babies are the poured blood is being studied. And we're looking at about 287 chemicals in babies. Most of them are, we don't even know the effects of. And as Dr. Paul said, this is part of the equation, and Dr. Suruji as well. So finally, I want um, I like I think of wireless. And EMF is the key piece of the autism puzzle because it really impacts a lot of the other factors. So, you've got wireless. We talked about the potential impact on genetics, and the sperm. The sperm research is pretty strong. I would say at this point, it's I you know I can't recommend putting itself in your pocket. So you've got that effect on genetics. You've got the biological effect of just getting the body. You've got the calcium effect. You've got the cortisol thing going on and just getting the body more into sympathetic nervous system mode. So switching that into that fight or float mode. Fight or float, fight or flight, whatever. <laughs> All right. So, and then when you think about chemical toxins, your body is, your body is like a funnel. These toxins are coming in, but you've got mechanisms to detox. When you're in fight or flight mode, it's like that, the bottom of that funnel gets squeezed off, right? So you, that's where you can start getting into basically state of overload. So we like to think of this, Martha Herbert likes to think of this as not as something, not as a genetic trait, but as a state, a state of overload from total load, from all these factors. But I think the factor that we're missing the most, that most people don't even look at at all, is wireless and EMF. Now, so you, you, you may know someone with autism, you may have that in your family or know children with that, but most people are not exposed to that right now. And so here are some common symptoms that everyone is really being exposed to. Sleep disturbance, is anyone having problems with sleep right now? <laughs> Been there, done that, yeah. Um, it's not pretty. Uh, ringing in the ears, is anyone having problems with ringing in the ears, tinnitus? Okay. Restlessness? I got one on restless. Heart palpitations. Yeah, the arrhythmia, they're going fast or slow. Headaches? Uh, attention problems? I think I've had all of these, basically. Um, memory issues. I don't remember having memory issues. Okay. Depression is a big issue. So on a positive front, um, you know, we're in Silicon Valley. You know, friends of mine are the cell phone designers. I went to school with some of these folks. Um, we created this problem. Which also makes, you know, we can, we can uncreate this. The telecom corporations created the problem. problem. Not yeah, exactly. People. Exactly. I shouldn't say it, but I, I feel like we, should, we can take a sense of ownership. And no one's going to, no one puts these things next to your body. We're the ones that, the majority of us put it. You, I know you don't. But the majority of people are putting this next to their body, feeling it is safe. So we can roll back to known good states. It wasn't always like this. You know, and as citizens and consumers, we can demand actual safety, which is what you asked for. Uh, and what I said is the closest sources, and we've heard this before, the closest sources have the, the greatest impact. So every time you uh, double the distance, the radiation level goes down 75%. As you have the distance, the radiation level goes up four times. Okay? So you control that. I'd love to blame that on the wireless industry, but Usually, that's usually us. And so again, we control the closest sources, so I want people to feel like this is not a totally disempowering situation, that there is 
there are some things you can do. So what you can do today, keep cell phones away from your body. So I think at the Commonwealth Club in 2010, I, after like the first talk, I turned my cell phone into airplane mode and put it back in my pocket. Now I keep it in my backpack. It's usually off in my backpack. And if it's on, it's a distance from my body. And especially not only, yeah, not only from your head, but again from your reproductive organs. And your heart as well. Not, yeah, so it's not a lot left, so that's why I keep it in a bad bed. Um, so we can also do Dr. Yelch's protocol, I'll give a little preview of what she's come up with, which I think is quite brilliant, which is turning off uh, baby monitors, cordless phone base stations, Wi-Fi, and then the bedroom circuit breaker at night. So the first three are for wireless signals, and the last one is for uh, uh, magnetic uh, EMF fields and dirty electricity. Uh, Dr. Dunkley's protocol is basically kind of a screen time fast. Is another brilliant protocol that's just come for focus here. I can't wait to hear her talk again. You can also look on antennasearch.com. Now, this is getting a little bit out, out of our scope and out of what we can control, but sometimes we can control where we move, where our kids go to school, where our offices are. So um, go to antennasearch.com and look at the antennas. And the top end, uh, you can hire a building biologist to measure your home, school, or office. Uh, these are some photographs from a report that a building biologist here did, uh, Cameron. Uh, this is a cell tower behind Gunn High School, uh, behind the Math and Science Building. This shows the radiation level behind those buildings. I don't know if people are familiar with what's going on at Gunn High School. It's a suicide cluster right now. So, um, I've been working on this, I guess, for the last eight years, and. Uh, I try to, I notice I can talk to people forever, and, and you know, you can't, you can't influence people, especially in Silicon Valley. Uh, it's hard, it's harder to. But when I, what I find is if people can have an experience of what this feels like, then they own it, right? And then it becomes hard to deny. Because, because that's what's happened, that's what happened to me. So, um, I've been playing around with really low EMF environments, and then I have demos of things that are really high EMF. And I demonstrate these things for people. I go into people's homes and I turn things on and off and I do demos for people in this low EMF environment. And um, so here are some comments that I've gotten uh, from people over the last eight years. Uh, this is from a, a family, uh, from a colicky baby who had never slept in six months. They turned off their Wi-Fi and all of a sudden the baby slept through the night and she said, we are all sleeping better. But now their colicky baby actually sleeps. Uh, it feels more like outside. You know, we've been outside, we've been out in nature. I, you know, we have to discern the difference in the uh, One person, a reporter, I had a hard, hardest time getting this guy to feel anything. And, and he couldn't, you know, he was really in his head, and that's fine. Uh, and finally, I got him to feel a magnetic field. He was like, oh, I, I feel that in my gut. So we all feel these in different places. Some people are feeling it in their head. Uh, some people feel it in their skin. Some people feel it in their gut. It's kind of a nervousness or anxiety or nausea. Um, one person said, my head feels different, clearer. Uh, I feel more kind of openness. Uh, that's what Dr. Yelter took me to a really low EMF space on the coast, and you could just feel your head just opens up. Um, what else? So skin, I think I feel things different. I feel magnetic fields kind of in my head. Uh, skin, dirty electricity, high frequency noise, and electric fields I feel on my skin. It feels kind of creepy. Uh, that wired feeling, that wired and tired. That can be electric fields, but I think that's also a lot of calcium efflux. Um, what else have I heard? Um, uh, one of the, the, I worked at an autistic, uh, uh, home of an autistic family this week, um, and put in some devices that lowered electric fields. And the, both the father and the mother have never claimed that they've elect, are electrosensitive, but they said, oh, I feel that. It feels that they started trying to describe the feeling. It was great, because I was not putting words in their mouth. And, and they're just like, I feel that. They're just trying to understand what the difference was. And um, at the end, he just, the, the, the guy said, you know, I just feel more present. I feel like something just like a, a, sh like a sheet just went away and I get to feel more present. And I feel like, for me, when I, uh, I'm in a, a better zone, I, my, my vision is more dimensional, third, third dimensional. And when I'm in a high enough zone, it feels just kind of flat. Um, so I have a website, clearlightventures.com. Uh, there's a short URL, clv.us. Okay, so we have a website. I have demos of uh, what does Wi-Fi sound like with a meter. I've got um, blogs on a lot of these topics from sleep 
to autism, to just you know wireless safety in general. Could you um, repeat the website, please? Yeah. The website is the short one is clb.us. Dot us. That's the shortcut. And the full one is clearlightventures.com. Okay? If you go to that website slash blog, you can sign up for a newsletter. So we have a newsletter informing people, you know, keeping up people on the latest research these folks are doing um, and sharing blogs and articles. And, um, we have a Facebook group uh, on. Um, it's called Autism and EMF. So if you know anyone, if you have any kids on the spectrum, we're discussing um, the protocol, like Dr. Yelter's protocol, and supporting parents and trying to get them to the point where they can do that and, and get the feedback as this all evolves. It's all very new. 